Welcome everyone, I think I've just gone live on YouTube and um, yeah, today I'll be talking about the Stonewall Dutch. I think it's a very interesting structure mainly. Um, the Dutch relates to the opening 1d4 f5, but I'm mainly going to be talking about a specific structure, not about a specific opening today. Um, and it's also connected to yeah, kind of specific moves. Uh, you cannot always play the spe uh, Stonewall Dutch. Um, you cannot, for example, always play the Dutch. Um, after one e4, you're not really allowed to do it. So it's mainly connected towards one d4 openings. But you can play the Dutch uh, basically against any other move except for one e4. Uh, against one c4, you can al also do it. And against one knight f3, also very much possible. So um yeah the only move we cannot really play the stonewall against is one e4 the reason for that is because he already attacks these two squares and those are two squares that we actually want to, to put our pawns on so we cannot really do that so um it's mainly a 1d4 uh, structure and um yeah let's get right into it so we play one f5 which is the dutch um Typical move is, and yeah, actually this is already a kind of an offbeat opening. It's it's not so uncommon, but it's definitely not one of the main responses against one d four and uh, one c four and one knight f three. Um, that is because it probably doesn't have a uh, too good of a reputation. In general, I think the main status after one f five is that what is supposed to be better. The thing, however, is though that because it's not so often played. Uh, White is not too familiar with these positions. He might not be up to date in his theory, and all, that very often makes up for um, yeah you playing a, a not so great move. So um, it's not too big of a deal that we are not playing the best move uh, at the very start. Uh, more common is either one knight six or one d five. But the one I'm going to be showing today is actually um, that the stolen structure. So let's get into the stonewall structure. Um, so first few moves. And yeah, this is exactly the stonewall structure. So the pawns need to be on f5, e6, and d5. Um, usually the pawn will also go to c6 to support its center. But uh, you could also leave the pawn on c7 for the moment. That's also fine. And um, this is the typical stonewall structure. There's not... yeah. And the reason why it's called the stone wall is because it's a, it's basically like a wall. It's very hard to break through. Um, all of the pawns are protecting each other. It's not so easy to attack. It's, it's, yeah, white puts a little bit of pressure on it with the pawn on c4. But whenever he takes on c4, we simply capture back with a pawn. And it's simply very, very difficult for white to get rid of this d5 pawn. So it's, we have a structure that's very hard to get rid of. But on the other end, there are, are, of course, also some things which are not ideal in our structure. We've already put all of our center pawns on the light squares. By putting all of our pawns on the light squares, it means that we've weakened our dark squares a lot. So what you will very often see in these stonewall structures is that uh, the squares E5 and F4 especially will often get weak. You can, for example, already see that this knight uh, from F3 can jump into this square and it will not be contested with any pawn. It cannot be attacked with the D pawn, it cannot be attacked with the F pawn, which means that it's hard to get rid of this 95. I have seen the YouTube channel of Anisha, I've even been there. But uh, let's go back. Um, so there are some benefits to this uh, structure, but there are definitely also weaknesses. In general, objectively speaking, I would say that this structure is uh, considered to be better for white, but um the thing is that it's not that easy to play black has a lot of options in general on how to play such a position and um yeah it will you will easily get your opponent out of book in these positions after which it's just uh the both of you playing and i know that in general a lot of white players aren't too comfortable in these positions because it's simply not so easy to get the right plan um, but first we start to go into plans. Let's talk a bit about the pieces. 
so we've already seen the structure. Um, in general, not too much will change about our structure, so we should mainly talk about the pieces actually. And um, one thing should be clear the moment you see this pawn structure is that this dark square bishop is your good bishop, and this light square bishop is your bad bishop. Um, because simply right now you can see that this bishop is not very active, while this bishop already has a lot of choices. And that is because uh, the pawns are in the light squares. So one thing you will very often, for example, see is that white is trying to get rid of the dark squared bishop and eventually uh, leave us with the light squared bishop. So one typical plan, for example, is to go b3, followed by bishop a3 to try and exchange off this bishop and get rid of it. After which, um, yeah, we are left with this uh, more or less bad light squared bishop. It's not... It's not the end of the world if we lose the dark square bishop, but it's definitely something which we should be trying to avoid. Um, so that's already one of the main plans for white. I think um, the other minor pieces are not that too important. Um, it's not like there's a bad knight or a good knight. I think though that one thing uh, black should be aiming for is in general to try and exchange pieces. We should not try to exchange the dark square bishop, but um we would be okay with all the minor pieces being traded off for example part of that is because we have slightly it feels like at least we have slightly less space why is two uh pawns more or less in the center well we only have one pawn in the center if we compare it to uh white's position so white has a slightly more space which means that we should be okay with exchanging minor pieces. however how do we ever get rid of this uh light squared bishop well, one plan uh, which we will get into uh, later on is to get this bishop from d7 to e8 to h5. And suddenly we have maneuvered our bishop to a much more active square. On this square it will uh, contest this knight, it will put pressure on the pawn and on the queen. So there's a lot of stuff going on on this diagonal. And um, that's one of the main typical plans to yeah, exchange of this bishop or at least make it more active if it doesn't get exchanged. And another plan I would say is to play b6, maybe even b5, and then put this bishop on b7 or a6. On, there's a lot of things going on, a lot of pressure on this diagonal, so it would make sense as well to put it on b7. Maybe eventually we can push for a c5 break, so it does make a lot of sense as well to put it on b7. And on the other end, it would be very active as well if we put it on a6, because on a6 it puts pressure on c4. But on the other end, it also puts pressure on e2 and even on f1, because there's likely going to be a rook on f1 pretty soon after white castles kingside. Uh, so very often white will, for example, play castle kingside here. Why d4 and not bishop e7 first? Um, when... No, I'm, I'm, I wasn't assigned this opening because of my nationality. Um, it's slightly random. Actually, one thing my, my previous coach always used to say is that um, he thought it was a pity that... Um, okay, there's one opening in chess that's named after the Netherlands, which is the Dutch. And then we get assigned with the move 1f5, which is one of the worst openings out there. So he wasn't very happy about that, but uh, it's not as bad as you would think. There are definitely better openings, but it's very, very practical opening and uh, I think very playable. Um, and after white castles, black plays bishop d6. Here it makes a lot of sense to play b3. This plan I talked about, trying to get in bishop a3. So the question is, what should black do right now? And I think the most common move, and the move that makes the most sense actually, is the move queen to e7. And with this move, um, yeah, black slightly improves the piece. The queen is slightly more active on e7, but mainly we're trying to avoid bishop a3. So now, with the bishop a3, we can simply snap it off, and we will be winning a piece because the queen protects the bishop. So um, we have prevented bishop a3. You can make a case for playing a4. After the move a4, we definitely cannot prevent bishop a3 because it's now protected with the rook. However, white doesn't really want to weaken the key, uh, queen side so much. And after the move a5, what we'll see is that white has weakened this square a lot. And a typical plan might be, for example, to play knight a6, knight b4, or b6, bishop a6, and 
I think in general white doesn't really want to weaken his king uh, queen side so much. So he has played b3, but he hasn't really been able to play bishop a3. And uh, the first game I wanted to show today was the game uh, between Anand and Carlsen. Um, I actually, when I saw that I was going to be giving a lecture on the Stonewall, I was immediately reminded of the recent uh, video series on Justin Ford. Um, because it is a video series by the man himself, Magnus Carlsen. So if you're a premium member on this, on Justin Ford, definitely check it out. Um, it's definitely worth it uh, because it's it's body world champion. It's not it cannot get any better, of course. And uh, one of the games he analyzes in this course is as well this game. Here it's free to watch, however. Um, so I'm going to be discussing this game, and in this game, Anand went 95. So as I said, we weaken the e5 square a lot, so it makes a lot of sense to put the knight here. And a typical plan would be actually to try and hold on to this square by playing, for example, knight e2, knight e3, protecting the knight once more, and maybe bringing out this bishop as well to f4. It's a bit strange, though, to bring the bishop to f4 while we've already played b3. Um, queen e7 then has been logical for, white, uh, for black, a uh, useful move, while b3 hasn't been that logical. So it doesn't make too much sense to combine bishop f4 together with um, b3. So why is mainly going for knight d2, knight f3 here? Uh, Carlson castled makes a lot of sense. Typical for the stonewall is that both sides actually castle uh, king side, and the reason why is actually such a fun opening is that even though both sides have castled at uh, both, yeah, both white and black have castled on the same side, but black is still going to try and mate white. So one thing you will very often see is that black will try to storm with these pawns and try to simply checkmate white, while white is the one uh, trying to get some play on the queen side with, for example, b4, b5. In this game, it was a bit more dif uh, different uh, because Carlsen played it in a more uh, positional way. Anand went the move knight to d2 here. And Carlsen played the move a5. In general, uh, in chess these days, especially, we've understood that uh, advancing your outside pawn, so the A and the H pawn uh, is in general a good idea. So it makes a lot of sense pushing the A pawn, it grabs a little bit of space, uh, makes it more difficult to play B4 eventually for white. And one good question actually already in chat is whether or not white should be playing C5. And in general, I would say you have to be very careful about this. Um, I don't think white wants to close the center yet because then there's really no pressure against this center. Then it becomes even more stable than it already is. And you also have to be very careful because the moment you play c5, you also create a weakness. So for example, in this position, if you play c5, white, black could take, take, and then go knight d7. And what we see is that both of these pawns are attacked. So black is simply winning a pawn here. White could have done this um, earlier on as well, of course. So for example, in this position, he could have also played the move B, uh, C5. But again, I don't think it makes too much sense because um, now it's simply very difficult to get a knight to E5. If you play knight E5, again, we take and these pawns get weak like this. So um, you can play C5, but I don't think it makes too much sense because or very early on you don't really want to do it because it can create a weakness and the moment you put the pawn on c5 as well because there's no pressure on the center it's a lot easier for black to go for the e5 break actually because um if without c5 if black will would be pushing for so let's say we push e5 here or let, let's start with the move 97, for example, he plays a random move like 92. We don't really want to go e5, because the moment we go e5, we allow, for example, c takes d5, c takes d5, d takes e5, and now we're left with this isolated pawn on d5. So we don't really want to go for the e5 push too soon, because it leaves us with a very weak structure. The moment, however, white plays c5, we are more inclined to do this, because then... Um, the moment we go e5, not only can you not take on d5 and create this isolated pawn,
but also the c5 pawn can become weak because the defender of d4 has been is gone at that moment and it, we simply create this weakness on c5 so why doesn't really want to play this move too early on What's the correct position for white to take an e5 break? Yeah, so one more typical plan I would like to explain before I go into the game too far is the plan of breaking up the center completely. So one thing white could aim for in these positions is eventually to go f3 followed by e4 and then completely create uh, opening up the center. And in general white would like to do this because as I said, he has slightly more space, so it makes sense to open up the center as well, gain even more space by putting an up, uh, putting another pawn in the center, and it opens up a lot of files. Well, black is the one trying to keep the position closed uh, by putting his pawns like this in the center. Um, he's trying to keep the position closed as much as possible, so it makes sense to try and break in open for white because it's something black is trying to avoid. So f3, e4 is something white could aim for, but for example, in this position, it's not really great. I think, for example, after f3, the typical break move in the stone wall can be played, which is move c5. And as you can see, the situation in the center is becoming very unstable. So before white can ever push f3, e4, white should first try to stabilize the center and then push for this break. Um, I think this opening is mainly uh, strategical, so not very dynamic. We, we keep a very um, close center, so the opening is mainly uh, strategical. However, at some point the opening can become very dynamic, because at some point um, black is going for this king side attack, and the moment we try to start uh, checkmating white, white is also trying to gain his own play along the queen side so even though it's strategical at first eventually it might become very dynamic because it becomes a race uh, who gets his own play first so it, it can also become a very dynamic opening but it starts being very strategical and very solid so let's go into the game a5 is played gaining space bishop b2 and here Carlsen wanted to put pressure on the knight in e5, makes a lot of sense, so he played the move knight to d7. We, were, we keep on having this problem with this bishop though. So um, the question is how do we, uh, yeah, how do we play on? How do we keep on improving our pieces? And the idea that Carlsen had in mind was to put the knight to e4, the other knight to f6. And kind of follow this same strategy that white is doing so white had this strategy of playing knight d2 knight 3 and he already put his knight to e5 and we are also doing this strategy on our own we put the knight in e4 put the other knight to f6 and then this bishop f3 to develop again maybe to d7 e8 or maybe eventually even to b6 b7 uh, bishop b7 however i would like to say though that with this um knight in e5 it's always kind of difficult to go b6 because the knight's always putting pressure on the pawn on c6. So we need to keep the pawn on c6 protected. Uh, so white plays queen c2. a4 happened. Um, not yet going for this knight e4 plan, but it makes a lot of sense as well. Gaining more space, pushing this outside pawn even further. In general, you want to push your outside pawns as uh, further up the board as possible. So a4 makes sense. White doesn't really want to take. Um, because it leaves his pawn structure very weak. Um, eventually, black will be able to uh, take back on a4. Even if he is not able to, it doesn't matter too much that he's down a pawn because the pawn structure has been ruined and the two a pawns have both been now isolated. So it's not really a move white wants to make. Knight to f3 happened following the strategy. And now Carlson does go for knight e4. e3 happened. And actually this idea of a4, a5, a4 wasn't only to take on b3, opening up this a-file, but it was also because eventually maybe the move a3 might be an idea. Now that um, bishop c3 is not really possible because uh, black is likely to take the bishop, um, which would be a nice trait, winning a, knight, uh, winning a bishop for a knight, um, basically means that 
a3 makes a lot of sense because you also don't really like to go bishop c1. The moment white, for example, goes bishop c1, black can already start pushing on the king, so I do the move g5 and already start this attack that he's been wanting to get. And it's really not so clear where white's play is, while black is already getting close to attacking the white king. So this would be nice. Um, bishop c3 was played. Carlson didn't take on c3 either. I, th I think it would be a good move actually to take the bishop. Carlson didn't want to. I think he mainly wanted to keep the pieces on the board. Tried to keep as many winning chances alive as possible. So he went um, and he went for another trade. He went for the move knight takes e5. And the reason why he went for the move knight takes e5 was to get rid of these knights. So that he can finally develop this bishop. It's clear that he cannot go for this basic plan anymore. Because there's this constant pressure on the pawn on c6. So he goes for the move bishop d7 instead. What about being b5, bishop b6, is a wave? Yeah, so um, eccentric, it's very difficult to do this, to play a4. Because the moment you push this pawn to either b6 or b5, white can always take on c6. So it's very difficult to play either b6 or b5 with the knight on e5, putting pressure on c6. So he develops his bishop in this way. And now I think Anand more or less makes a mistake, actually. Um, a strategical mistake. Um, he takes the bishop. I think this is more or less a mistake because of two reasons. One is that white is uh, not really wanting to exchange too many minor pieces. And the other is that he exchanges his knight, his nice knight on e5, for this bishop, which wasn't too great. The bishop was about to go to e8 and h5, becoming active. But I think it's not such a great plan. I think a much better move is actually bishop e1 back. And the reason for that is because white wants to keep the minor piece on the board. He keeps the dark squared bishop as well, and not allowing it to be traded for a knight. Um, you don't really want to lose the bishop pair. So I think bishop e1 would have made most sense. Um, so knight takes d7 happened, queen takes d7. Uh, sorry. S and now an went for c5. Uh, interesting move. I, I think it's now not such a big deal. Um... The thing is that Anand wanted to uh, start creating play. Uh, Black is basically ready to go g5 followed by the f4 break or maybe h5 h4. So Black is ready to start the kingside attack and White has to create his own play. So he went c5 followed by b4 trying to go b5 as quickly as possible and opening up this b file. Another idea was that it makes the a3 pawn quite weak. Um, because this it's not protected with the bishop anymore. So the a3 pawn could become weak, but it's not so easy. It's still protected by the rook, and um, it's not that easy to attack at all. So it's not really such a big deal. So b4 happened, and now Carlson went for the attack. He went h5, trying to go h4, trying to open up this h-file. Bishop b1 happened, not allowing this exchange anymore. But there was one thing the bishop was doing on c3, which was targeting the e5 square. And the moment there's no pressure on e5 anymore, black can go for this break. And this was one thing I talked about before, is the moment that white pushes c5, it becomes a lot easier to go e5. Because if the pawn were still on c4, he could, he could take on d5, c takes d5, followed by d takes e5, and we would be left with this isolated d pawn. But now he can take, but because he's not able to take on d5 as well, we actually have a very strong pawn on d5 instead of a weak pawn on d5. So actually, um, it's been great for black that there's this that white has closed the center with c5. So that's quite nice to see. Um, well, one of the reasons why white doesn't want to exchange this knight for the bishop is that white has a little bit more space in general in these stonewall positions. And the more... Uh, pieces get exchanged especially the minor pieces it's a lot easier to move around the other pieces so if you have a look for example at this position very typical stonewall position um, we can see that black is mainly putting his pieces on the third and or the sixth and the seventh rank we do have this e4 square but apart from the e4 square we do not have too many squares to put our pieces so um, if we do not have a lot of 
squares for pieces. Um, if you have a look, for example, if at the white position, he has loads of uh, squares for his pieces, um, more than black has at least. So if you have less uh, square for your pieces, you should be trying to exchange them to open up space for the others. So for example, the moment we got rid of this um, knight to d7, we immediately open up the square for the bishop. So we should be trying to exchange minor pieces. So this, this trade happened. Um, Gosson got in the e5 break. d takes e5, bishop takes e5, rook d1. And now um, Anand does have the bishop pair, which I think is the main upside of his position. And one thing you should be trying to do when you have the bishop pair is open up the center. So it's already clear that Anand is going for the f3, e4 break. So he's trying to get an e4 as soon as possible. Carlsen saw this coming, of course. Um, this is one reason why he put the rook on the d file. Because if he gets an e4, then the d5 pawn is pinned. So Carlsen went out of this pin. f3 happened, not f6. And Anand is not really ready to go e4 yet. At the very least, you can, for example, just exchange everything. And we get rid of this light squared bishop. And uh, black would be very happy here, probably. So instead, Anand prepared the e4 break with the move uh, bishop h3, pinning this f5 pawn, so that after e4, he cannot ever take with the f pawn. So this increases the pressure and makes it more easy for Anand to go for e4. Carlsen saw, some, saw something sneaky, however. Um, he saw that... Well, first of all, uh, we also need to do something in general about this f5 pawn, because it's already being attacked twice. Um, and it's only being defended once, so we really got to protect it. So he plays the move g6. But we do allow the move e4. And now the question is, how do we answer this? So, and I think uh, Carlsen did it actually in a very interesting way. Um, one, one way to... Um... Play here is to play the move d takes e4. He cannot really go f takes e4, and you have to do do something. E takes f5 is coming, and the reason why he wants to go d takes e4 as well is that he's opening up this diagonal for the queen. So um, the idea that Carlson had in mind was actually to play bishop b2. Seems a bit strange, put the bishop in uh, kind of an awkward square, but it does cut this protection of the queen. Anand takes an f5, and now Carlson took this a2 pawn. And this is also one of the reasons, uh, or in general, one of the reasons why you should be put pushing your outside pawns as uh, far as possible is that um, the a2 pawn will become weak. Um, and the moment you take it, you actually already have a very advanced pawn. So um, one very deep strategy behind pushing this a pawn was that he, this a3 pawn might actually become very dangerous once the a2 pawn is gone. Um, and also, the question is what happens after f takes g6, which seems to win an extra pawn. But this queen on c2 is also undefended, so this would uh, immediately lose to the move bishop to d4 check. Um, and then simply you can take the queen afterwards. So, Anand played bishop f2, preventing that bishop d4 is with check. And now Carlsen had the time to do something about this g6 pawn. He went g5, closing down his king. And even though there are no pawns in front of the king, the king is actually still somewhat safe because um, the f, g, and h files are still closed. So it's actually very hard to go after this king. Meanwhile, what Carlsen will do is queen back to f7 and then start pushing his a pawn. And his a pawn is very close to promoting. So rookie one, queen f7 happened. Rookie six, Anand is trying to gain play. Knight g4. And this is probably not too great of a move because it opens up this 6th rank and um, the rook is getting close to the king. First this exchange happened and now we gave this check. And even though our king is somewhat weak, it's not so easy to go after it. And here Anand made the final mistake. Um, Carlsen is more or less threatening soon to win the game with a2. So you for example play bishop back to f6 followed by a2 winning the game. So Anand needs to do something very quick. And it turns out actually the move rookie 6 would have held. It's a bit strange, but this was his best chance somehow. He instead thought that the sacrifice of rookie 7 was working. 
or I'm actually not so sure what the nun exactly missed, but he thought rook d7 was a nice move. Queen takes d7, f6, and now he's opening up this um, diagonal. He could have done that as well in the previous move without giving away the rook, but then uh, we could take this rook with the queen, so he cannot really do that. So you have to first distract the queen, then go f6, opening up that diagonal. <laughs> Let me draw it correctly, like this. Um, but there is a nice move actually for Carlsen in this position. Uh, can you, if you're watching his stream, can you try to find the best, the best move for black in this position? So the move here is not a2, um, because what well, actually had the threat. So the threat was uh, rook g7 check, and it's a double check. Um, so let's say a2, rook g7, king h8, and we simply get checkmated. So it's not really what we want to play. Yeah, a2 doesn't work. Um, someone is saying rook h8, but it doesn't really do much about rook g7. Um, however, Berserk seems to have found the right move. And the right move is queen to d1 check. Distracting this queen has to take because it would check. And now we take the rook. And because we have gotten rid of this rook and the queen is also not so close anymore to checkmating us, we're simply winning this game. Because this our a pawn is still there and it's very close to becoming a new queen. So And we are not even down material at the moment. Queen d3 check happened and he went king h6, making sure nothing happens to his king. And after the move h4... En passant takes h3. Um, Anand simply resigned. Because this a pawn is going to become a queen. And the king is still quite safe. It's actually nothing you can do against this king. So uh, it was a very nice uh, stonewall game by uh, Carlsen. Demonstrating first of all that you should not be allowing this exchange on a3 to happen. And then second of all he didn't go for one of the main plans immediately. He, he showed us that you don't have to go... Bishop e6, uh, bishop d7, uh, bishop b8, bishop h5. Immediately, he shows that you don't need to necessarily go b6, bishop a6. It actually goes for a different plan, which also is quite okay for black. So in this kind of stonewall position, you can actually do a lot of different things, play it in a different way, and find one that um, that that you like, basically. Um, let's go to another game. And one game I was really happy to be showing today. And also one it shows one thing actually, which is that um, the Stonewall structure is not a structure you can only get from one F5. Um, this game featured one D5. It was a very recent game. It was a game between Noel Studer and uh, Richard Rapport in the Bundesliga uh, Championships of 2020. So it was very recent, uh, about a few weeks ago. And even though, um, yeah, we haven't put the pawn on f5 yet, we still have the possibility to do so. Um, so even though we played one d5, we still have this possibility to go for the stone wall. C4 happened, e6, knight f3, uh, c6, playing the triangle slav, and it's an opening which. Um, Keeps a lot of option, options open um, because you're still very flexible with this f pawn. So in some variations you want to go f5. On the other end, uh, you might want to take on c4, followed by protecting it with b5, and then b5 has already been protected with the c6 pawn. So there are some ideas behind the c6 move, this triangle slab. And after the move knight to d2, aiming for uh, the e4 break while also protecting this pawn. Uh, Rapport went for the move f5. And now we get into the stonewall structure again, but not from the Dutch. Um, so you can actually get this structure via a lot of different openings than uh, only one f5. Um, I would also like to show you, for example, you can get it from the Catalan. You can even start with one knight f6 and still get it. Um, one variation I've played myself, for example, uh, is this one against the Catalan with bishop b4 check. The idea is to drive the bishop to d2 and then go back. Bishop g2, and it seems a bit unclear yet how we're going to get the stonewall structure. 
but by driving his bishop to d2, it's become a target. So after the following moves, we can go knight e4, and we're opening up the um, this line for the f pawn to march to f5. And here, um, they d don't really want you to take the dark squared bishop. So one thing they will often do is play bishop f4, and now we can play knight to d7. And after the move knight c3. First we go g5, creating space on the queen side because we are going f5 anyway. Bishop c1 should be played and now f5. And now you can see this stonewall structure again. We've already managed to put the knight on e4. We've managed to go f5, g5. It's not so clear yet what white has managed meanwhile. And um, the bishop can move soon to d6. Not very necessary by the way. But um, this is, for example, also a good example of how you can get the stonewall structure from a very different opening than 1f5. But let's go back to this Rapport game, to this position. And um, White uh, went for this g3 setup. I think in general, against the stonewall, the main setup that White should be choosing is to fianchetto the bishop on g2. I think these days we've kind of recognized uh, or seeing that the bishop is the best on g2 against this structure. Um, and after the move g3, Rupert went for knight d7. It seems a bit strange not to start with knight f6, but actually um, Rupert wanted to keep the options open. Because after the move knight d7, bishop g2, he went for the very creative looking knight h6. In general, you don't really want to put your knight on uh, on the A file or the H file because it's very uh, inactive there. But it will go to a much better square from H6. It will soon go to F7. And actually, one thing I haven't talked about yet is that a knight in F7 in the stonewall structures is very nice. Um, and the reason for that is also because it very often simply doesn't happen. For example, in the previous game, we've seen that the knight immediately went to f6, which is something uh, simply very, very common. So uh, usually you it's kind of hard to maneuver your knights to f7 because your knight's on f6. It's hard to get to f7 from f6. It cannot do, it's a knight, so it cannot really do that very easily. So something which sometimes happens in the stonewall is that black plays knight f6. And at some point he plays knight e4. And then actually a typical or a maneuver that does exist is move knight to d6 back and then moving the knight to f7. But because the knight stayed on g8, it can in this, in this position actually go to h6 immediately and then go to f7, which is a quicker way. And um, yeah, also one reason why Rapport is allowed to do this is because of this knight on d2. Um, in general, the knight on d2 is not so great in the stonewall positions, especially if the knight is not really able to go to e5. Here, for example, white wouldn't really like to go to e5. I think black simply takes. And in general, white doesn't really want to go for this structure. Um, this e pawn could become weak, for example, knight f7 attacking it. Um, and... Yeah, it's not really what white wants. He's already doubled his e-pawns and uh, black should be okay here. So the knight's not really allowed to go to e5, which means that this knight on d2 is also kind of bad. And especially after the move knight f7, knight e5 is not even uh, an option anymore because it now simply loses a pawn. So this is one of the reasons why the knight's so nice on f7. is because Yeah, it simply has a very nice control of the e5 square. So if we have a look at the structure again, um, we've put all of our pawns on the light squares, which means that we've lost the control over the dark squares. So it makes a lot of sense to try and start controlling those dark squares with our pieces instead, because we're not able to do it anymore with our uh, pawns. So it makes a lot of sense actually to put the knight in F7, try to control the dark squares, and try to control the light squares with your pawns. Um, in this game, White went b3. He didn't really want to castle yet because he was fearing the attack, like g5, h5 is coming, and he doesn't have a lot of play on, on his own. 
But report being report doesn't really care too much. It simply goes g5 anyway. White hasn't castled yet. Um, but it's not so great to castle queenside either because then black can start storming on the queen side. And as we have seen, uh, white usually does castle kingside anyway. So it's kind of a, um, yeah, a bit of an early move. But why you can like this stonewall so much is because our center is extremely stable. And because our center is extremely stable, we can do such weird things. We have basically zero development. We still have to develop the bishops. We still have to castle, move the rooks to better places. But because our center is so stable, we are allowed to do such funky stuff. So he went g5. Um, white went e3, trying to control the light squares, or sorry, the dark squares a bit more, trying to control this f4 square. And um, black played the move bishop to d6. Uh, once more, putting in uh, a piece on a very active square, controlling the e5 square once more. Very important, trying to control the dark squares. Bishop b2 happened, trying to gain control over dark squares as well. So in general, actually, even though we put all of our pawns on light squares in these uh, stone walls, we are fighting about the dark square control, which is kind of... Seems kind of strange at first, but it makes a lot of sense if you think about it. Um, because we have lost the uh, control of the uh, dark squares a bit, we need to take it back. And here, um, yeah, maybe white could soon consider to castle queenside. He has already managed uh, to be able to do this. So report goes for a5. Trying to... Um, yeah, so basically say to white, doesn't matter which side you castle to... I'll attack you anyway. So, for example, after castles, one thing one thing black could consider is already going b5 or simply a4. I think a4 makes a bit more sense. b5 would allow white to close it. So, I think a4 makes most sense. Trying to open up this a file and trying to go for the attack. So, the king is actually nowhere safe, except for maybe the center. But, uh, so, the next move made a little bit of sense. h4. And with this move h4, white gains a little bit of space on the uh, king side, but he's also, um, yeah, he's trying to make black close position. Because black is likely to go g4, and after g4, um, it's not so easy anymore to open up files. This h pawn has been blocked, the g pawn has been blocked, f4 is not so easy with these pawns on e3, g3, and e5 is the also very difficult with the pressure on d5 so it's not at all easy anymore to go for any breaks so uh report finished development castles 92 knight f6 trying to get the knight to e4 to a more active square knight f4 and here um report improves improved this queen so report is now improving his uh pieces as you can see, uh, Studer has managed to install his knight on a very nice square because uh, Report has put his pawns on light squares. The dark squares have been weakened, which does allow this knight to jump to f4. And now um, Studer made maybe a mistake. He thought actually, okay, I've closed the g file, I've closed the h file, blockaded on f4, so it's very safe probably to castle kingside. But Report had anticipated this. And he had seen that he had a very original plan here. Um, actually, it's not too original. It's a plan that occurs also somewhat often in the King's Indian, for example, when you can have s similar positions like this. He played the move knight h8. And the reason for this is because he really wants to get rid of this blockade. Um, he, he wants to be playing knight g6 and challenge this knight on g6. Also, the knight on f7 f7 wasn't doing that much anymore it's really difficult right now to get in the e5 break because there is so much pressure on d5 so you can't really go e5 and on the other end black white doesn't really put a knight on e5 anytime soon um he doesn't want to go to d3 because then he would be opening up for the f4 break so he wants to keep the knight in f4 while the other knight finds it rather difficult to go to e5 because the f3 uh, square has been guarded by the pawn so this knight has no way to get to e5 and this knight is also blocking on the king side. So it's actually, it doesn't matter too much 
how much control we have this e5 square. So he reroutes the knight to challenge the knight in f4. c5 happened. Bishop c7 and now a3. And I think you have to be very, very careful with pushing for c5. Because the moment you push for c5, as we've seen, it makes it a lot more easy to go e5. You don't have pressure anymore in the center. So I think maybe white should have actually waited with this push. Uh, Rapport continued his plan of knight g6. Yeah, so eccentric white could have decided to keep the king in the center with, um, for example, let's say in this position after queen e7, he could decide to go queen e2. The king in general is not so great in the center ever. As you can see, it already opens up for ideas like b6, bishop a6 putting pressure here. And also, um, we can still open up the center with e5 eventually. So the king is not at all safe in the center either. So he should probably go to the king's side anyway. Now h8 happened, c5, bishop c7, a3, trying to get in b4, trying to gain, uh, get play on this queen side. Knight g6 happened, which was the plan all along. And now b4. And now with this move, um, Studer is basically saying uh, that he doesn't mind it too much if you take an f4 because he will go ef4 um, after which these two pawns really prevent the e5 break um, you have this half open e-file to gain play on and um, it seems like there's really not a lot of play for black and the moment black doesn't have any active play anymore he's going to be slightly suffocated White has uh, basically more space. Black is this backward spawn. So if black doesn't manage to do anything active at some point, white will start pushing on the queen side, gain a lot of play over there, and black simply has to wait, which is not really great. But Rapport had seen that um, Studer actually shouldn't have gone for this pawn structure. Because even though he has no pawn breaks, he can still open up the position. And if you have no pawn breaks, you have to do that with a peace sacrifice. So, uh, Rapport went for the move knight h5. And with this move knight h5, he is basically already indicating that he's just going to be sacrificing on f4. And um, by sacrificing on f4, you get rid of this g3 pawn as well, which opens up uh, for the queen to capture on h4. So... It's very it's it's a very difficult situation actually for White, <laughs> especially because he already knows what's coming. He's or he already knows that you're going to be sacrificing on f4, queen h4 is coming, and you can do nothing about it. So White actually made a mistake by going for the structure, because Black does have a way to get through to the king. So rookie one happened, knight f4, g takes f4, bishop takes f4. And um, Studer already saw what was coming. He was seeing queen h4, followed by queen h2, removing this bishop, and then going f4, f3, or g3. And his king simply getting crushed very slowly, but very surely. So he has to be, he has to be very afraid right now. He has to do something spectacular to try and save this position. Because if he doesn't, then it's going to be very difficult. So the movie actually played was the very nice looking uh, knight to c4. And with this move, um, he's trying to give back the loss, uh, the one piece. And uh, trying to get counterplay of his own. Because if he doesn't get counterplay, he's going to get crushed on the king's side slowly. So um, what happens if he takes? So what will take... And the idea was not actually to take back, but to open up the position to go d5. And open up this diagonal, creating ideas of playing queen c3, trying to checkmate uh, black. And actually, in this position, it's white who is all the fun. With all the diagonals opened, um, he's down two pawns, or he will likely be. But it's, it's white playing for the initiative here. For example, c takes d5. Seems to be a good move. But then bishop takes d5 because the e pawn is uh, pinned. And it becomes very, very messy. For example, queen h4 seems very attractive to play. But now uh, white can strike back with rook e6. And this is really some uh, situation that 
black would like to avoid. Uh, black would like to get a position which black, uh, white, sorry, doesn't have a whole lot of play. So after move knight c4, um, Rapport basically ignored this with a move queen takes h4, going for his own play, going for this plan again of playing queen h2, followed by advancing his pawn uh, as soon as possible. Knight b6 happened. And here, uh, this is basically the move of the game actually. Uh, we haven't seen the most beautiful part of the game yet, it's still to come. Um, with the move knight b6, not only is white threatening knight takes a8, but he's also threatening to take on c8, getting rid of the defender of the e5 pawn, and, uh, sorry, e6 pawn. Yeah, the position after white plays rook takes e6 is equal, but it's it's very messy. It's equal because it eventually ends in a perpetual by best play by both sides, but it's very difficult. I didn't want to get uh, too far into that, but it's clear that black doesn't really want to uh, allow such a situation in which white has uh, a lot of play himself. So minus two threats by getting his knight to b6 which makes this knight c4 move even nicer because it was not only about giving away this knight but it was also about getting it to a better square um but at this moment studer uh, sorry uh, report struck back with the most beautiful move in this game maybe even the most beautiful move in the on the year people after this game people are already saying that this might be the game of the year which is, I, I definitely have to show it if people are already saying that about this game. So, so far, Black has already sacrificed a piece for three pawns. But now he's going to be sacrificing even more with the move e5. And it seems very, very difficult, but... Um, and very strange at first. But one thing that Black achieves by playing e5 is getting rid of knight takes e8 followed by rook takes e6. So he's, he's closing this e5 for sure. Another thing that he achieves with the move e5 is that he might go e4, completely close position, and then go f4, f3. And the third thing I would say that this move e5 achieves is that it opens up this diagonal. So very often I was already talking about going f4, f5, or sorry, f4, f3 actually. But the moment we go f4, this bishop can immediately jump to f5. So let's see what happens if uh, white takes this rook on a8. The move that Rapport wanted to play was actually not queen h2, but it was bishop h2. Uh, checking his king, he has to go to uh, f1, and then going f4. And now we can see why e5 is a brilliant, because now this bishop can jump to f5. I think the move that makes sense here is, for example, rook takes e5. But now we continue with the plan of playing f3. Threatening to, uh, for example, take. Then going g3, going bishop h3. A lot of attackers coming in. King will get checkmated, and I think it makes some sense to go bishop h1. But um, because we've played f3, we've opened up this diagonal once again, and after taking on e5, uh, we're also threatening to take on h1. There's not really a way to defend the bishop, and if we take the bishop, it's also already checkmate. So this is a good example of how uh, dangerous this position is for white. And after the move e5, white was thinking again that okay, I, I really need to give back this knight, I really need to open up the position. If I keep the position closed, it's it's way too dangerous. I cannot, I cannot leave it closed, because then I slowly get checkmated, as we've seen, if he takes a rook, for example. So he took on d5 instead, giving back this knight, trying to get, yeah, basically trying to open up the center. He does get his bishop on d5, attacking this king, Maybe then he'll get this diagonal open. So finally, um, White is getting some play. So c takes d5 happened. And here, I think um, White made a mistake. White should have gone bishop takes d5. Probably, king h8. And then d takes e5. Or no, sorry, this was also losing. It's actually already very, very difficult position right now maybe white actually try to defend it in the best way possible but in the line with bishop takes d5 can you d takes d5 it also looks very very logical and um black is about or sorry white is about to play e6 and basically win the game because the king will likely get checkmated and this 
e pawn will also storm down the board to e7. So e6 is coming, but black has a very beautiful move of playing bishop to e6. And basically blocking this e6, e5 pawn, and also driving with his bishop. Now bishop takes e6 is logical. And now again we play the move bishop h2 check, getting the bishop away. So eventually we might be able to push this pawn, but also so that after king f1, we go king, queen h3 check, king e2 only move, queen f3 check, king f1, and then g3. And with the mating threat of g2, this position is simply winning. So in this position, black has this beautiful move of bishop e6, stopping all the counterplay that white had, and then continuing the attack. So it was actually a very, very difficult position to hold for uh, white. He went rook e5, I think it's the best try actually. And now I think um, Rockport got a, yeah, a little bit greedy perhaps. He should have maybe, yeah, I believe his move wasn't the best, but it was very playable as well. He went bishop h2, king of one, bishop takes e5. Grabbing this exchange and still wanting to go f4, f bishop f5, trying to checkmate. What about playing rook e1 before bishop e6? Isn't the rook already on e1 in that line? I'm not sure which position you're talking about, Aditya. Um, and now he grabbed on d5 with check, so he needs to move the king. Now he grabbed the bishop. And if we start counting the material again, we'll see that black is up the exchange, but white seems to be having some compensation. Um, because if he does manage to go e6, he suddenly has his pass pawn which could be very very strong it's quite, uh, quite close to promoting and this king is very open so if e6 followed by queen's 3 happens for example then it will get tricky again but uh, Rapport played uh, very well he played a takes b4 opening up this a file um, which uh, finally makes this rook on a8 very active this rook has been very very passive on a8 for the whole game and another thing it does is uh, stops any queen c3 ideas. So with the pawn on b4, queen c3 is uh, prevented forever, um, as long as this pawn is there. So it not only gives his own rook play, but it also stops the opponent's play. The opponent went king e2, trying to go rook h1, trying to include the rook this way, also getting rid of any checks that black might have had. And now a report being report, he had to play an original move the the player reports very very original player uh, always and even when he is in such a position which should be technically winning if he plays the correct moves he's still very original and he does it in a very original way he plays the move rook takes a3 which is yeah another beautiful move i think um it's really unexpected as well um it gives back a little bit of material Black will always remain up at least a pawn, and the king on e2 will remain weak. So white took this exchange. As we can see, white can take on again on a3, but after move like f4, we're still up a pawn with black, and the king is still likely to get mated. F3 is coming, and still a very very strong attack. So instead, white went queen c3, trying to open up this diagonal with e6, trying to get some play again. Um, but f4 happened, Rapport still continuing with his own play. Now this pawn is taken, f3 check happened, king e3. King needs to keep protecting the f2 pawn. Now queen g5 check, king d3, rook d8, and finally this king, uh, yeah, is too, too vulnerable. This king has been hunted down this whole game basically. Uh, <laughs> as we could see in the beginning, couldn't really castle queenside. It cast the king side in the end, it wasn't safe over there. So, um, and the king will finally see its demise basically. Queen d4 happened, and um, yeah, so putting so many pieces on the default cannot be great. Bishop b6 happened, and uh, white resigned. And it was a very, very beautiful game, I I think, by report. Probably, maybe, maybe even his most beautiful game ever. Um, from a stone wall, and he actually was showing some original ideas as well. Um, this knight h6, knight to f7, very nice idea. 
and uh, I hope it gives more of an idea of the Stonewall Dutch. Um, yeah, he does sacrifice this exchange with black, but he's only giving back material. So he was he was up the exchange, but he does give back the exchange for a pawn. So he does remain up a pawn, and he does remain as a ch uh, or keep his attacking chances. So it's not like he gives up that much material, and he still has his attacking chances. So I I, I still like the move a lot, and um, it was simply a very very nice game by report. Um, so to conclude this stream, um, I think the stall wall is a very interesting opening. It might not be objectively the best opening out there, but I think practically speaking, it's always very playable. Um, as you could see, even Magnus beating Anand with black from a stone wall. So even at the very highest level, um, you could still play it and uh, get good results. I would actually recommend you, if you don't really have a Justin4 premium account, to maybe get one and then uh, have a look at the Stonewall series, uh, video series by Magnus on Chessin4 um, because it's simply very nice. It's not There's not a lot of material uh, made by the world champion explaining his thoughts and uh, explaining his own games and this is one where you get this chance so uh, try to check that series out and uh, I hope that series as well give you a better insight of the Stonewall Dutch. Um, I hope you liked today's stream. Uh, I think a lot of people are, might actually be watching Magnus play against Anish Giri. I might still catch the end. I'm not sure if they are still playing. But I hope to see you guys uh, next week for different subjects on...